May 31, 2013. What began as just another storm forecast over Oklahoma would unleash the widest tornado ever caught on radar, El Reno. In just minutes, a hidden supercell exploded into a monster 2.6 miles wide, trapping even expert chasers and leaving devastation in its wake. But how could the most powerful winds ever measured produce an official EF3? And why did experienced storm chasers pay with their lives? The answer starts with a sky about to break all the rules. In late May 2013, the skies over central Oklahoma were primed for disaster. Layers of warm, humid air surged north from the Gulf of Mexico, piling up over the southern plains. At higher altitudes, strong winds raced eastward, creating a sharp difference in wind speed and direction from the ground to the jet stream. Meteorologists call this wind shear, and it is a key ingredient for tornado formation. On the surface, a dry line, a boundary separating moist air from the east and hot, dry air from the west, snaked across western Oklahoma. This invisible line often serves as a launching pad for violent storms. The Storm Prediction Center, based in Norman, Oklahoma, took notice. Their morning outlooks warned of extreme instability, with the atmosphere holding enough energy to fuel explosive storm growth. The forecast models showed a volatile mix, hot, sticky air at the surface, cooler air aloft, and winds turning sharply with height. These conditions can twist a growing thunderstorm into a spinning supercell, the type most likely to produce strong tornadoes. Days of previous storms had already saturated the ground and left the region on edge. Each new round of severe weather increased the risk for both tornadoes and flooding. Forecasters tracked the position of the dry line and watched for subtle boundaries left behind by earlier storms, outflow boundaries that could focus even greater instability. By midday on May 31, 2013, the ingredients were all in place. Surface temperatures climbed into the mid-80s, dew points hovered in the upper 60s, and the wind profile showed a textbook setup for rotating storms. Thunderstorms began to fire along the dry line near the Highway 81 corridor, just west of Oklahoma City. These storms quickly tapped into the deep pool of warm, moist air, rising thousands of feet into the atmosphere within minutes. Meteorologists at the National Weather Service and the Storm Prediction Center monitored radar and satellite data, aware that any storm could rapidly intensify. The atmosphere was so unstable that even a small trigger, like a subtle wind shift or a boundary from earlier storms, could set off a chain reaction. The Storm Prediction Center issued a particularly dangerous situation tornado watch in the afternoon, a rare alert reserved for days when violent tornadoes are likely. Their warning highlighted the threat for long-track, intense tornadoes capable of causing widespread destruction. The operational concern was clear. With such strong wind shear and instability, any supercell could become a monster. The stage was set for a day that would test the limits of both science and survival. At 2 p.m. on May 31, 2013, the Storm Prediction Center issued a particularly dangerous situation tornado watch for central Oklahoma. The language was clear and urgent. Conditions favored the development of intense, long-track tornadoes. Forecasters at the National Weather Service office in Norman scanned radar screens, watching as thunderstorms erupted along the Highway 81 corridor. By late afternoon, one supercell began to dominate, showing signs of strong rotation just west of El Reno. At 5.33 p.m., the National Weather Service office in Norman issued a tornado warning for Canadian County. This was not routine. Radar was showing a deepening mesocyclone with wind signatures indicating a tornado could form at any moment. The warning polygon covered rural areas west and southwest of El Reno, including open fields and scattered homes. Weather radios sounded, sirens blared, and local broadcasters broke into programming with the latest updates. Spotters and chasers in the field relayed their observations. Some reported a lowering wall cloud, while others described a curtain of rain hiding the storm's base. Radar scans from Nexrad and mobile units like Rayxpol and Doppler on wheels painted a picture of a storm rapidly organizing, but the first visual confirmation was elusive. The atmosphere was primed and the warning was in effect, but for several minutes, the tornado itself remained hidden. At 6.03 p.m. Central Daylight Time, 
The tornado touched down about 8.3 miles west-southwest of El Reno, near coordinates 35.5289 degrees north, 98.0326 degrees west. The initial touchdown point was in open country, but the storm's rotation was already intense. Within moments, the tornado began carving its path across the landscape, growing in both width and strength. The National Weather Service tracked its movement in real time, issuing updates as the tornado moved east-northeast at roughly 20 to 25 miles per hour. The tornado warning, now in force, gave residents and travelers a narrow window to act. For the next 40 minutes, the El Reno tornado would stay on the ground, traveling a total of 16.2 miles before lifting near 35.6057 degrees north, 97.8336 degrees west. Throughout its life cycle, the National Weather Service continued to relay critical information, updating the warning as the tornado approached new communities and highways. Each radar scan and field report added detail to the unfolding crisis, but the storm's power was growing faster than even the most advanced tools could capture. By anchoring the timeline to the official warning and touchdown, the forensic record shows how quickly a forecast becomes reality. The period from the first particularly dangerous situation watched to the tornado's emergence on the ground was measured in hours, but the transition from warning to impact happened in minutes. For those in the path, the difference between awareness and survival often depended on how quickly they received and acted on these alerts. Rain hammered the fields west of El Reno, turning the horizon into a gray wall. In the heart of the supercell, the tornado's first moments played out almost entirely hidden from view. Unlike the classic photogenic tornadoes of the open plains, this one belonged to a different breed, a high-precipitation supercell. Here, the tornado funnel was shrouded by sheets of rain, hail, and swirling mist. Even seasoned storm chasers, equipped with radar and GPS, found themselves staring into a blur, unable to spot the threat until it was nearly on top of them. At ground level, chasers reported a thick, milky haze where the tornado should have been visible. Some described the sensation of pressure dropping, winds shifting, and debris swirling up from the fields, but the main circulation itself remained invisible. The rain wrapping was so complete that headlights, sirens, and even the distant flash of transformers offered no clue to the tornado's true position. Chaser video from this period shows splattered windshields and frantic voices, with drivers struggling to orient themselves as the storm's core approached. For residents and travelers, the danger felt abstract, until the wind roared and the world turned white. Inside the rain, the tornado was already growing in complexity. Mobile radar teams, like those operating Rax Pole and Doppler on wheels, later revealed that the El Reno tornado did not begin as a single smooth funnel. Instead, it spun up as a collection of smaller, violent subvortices, tight whirls orbiting within the larger circulation. These subvortices, each capable of producing their own bursts of destructive wind, danced around the hidden core. Some chasers caught brief glimpses of these ghostly fingers twisting out of the rain, only to vanish again as the precipitation wrapped tighter. The high precipitation cloak made real-time tracking nearly impossible. Warnings went out based on radar signatures, not visual confirmation. Spotters on the ground relayed only fragments, a sudden gust, a wall of debris, a fleeting shadow in the rain. For those in the path, the usual cues, darkening skies, a visible funnel, or a roaring sound, were muted or delayed. The tornado could be anywhere behind the curtain. As the circulation intensified, the hidden nature of the storm raised the stakes for everyone nearby. Chasers, emergency crews, and residents were forced to rely on technology and instinct, not sight, to judge their safety. In these minutes, the El Reno tornado was both everywhere and nowhere, its true size and violence masked by the rain-wrapped shroud. By the time the core circulation began its explosive expansion, the threat had already outpaced what most could see or imagine. In the space of less than half an hour, the El Reno tornado shattered every expectation of what a tornado could be. At 6.10 p.m., radar teams tracking the storm watched as the circulation began to widen, first to a mile, then doubling in size again and again. 
By 6.28 p.m., Rack's pole and Doppler on wheels had captured something never before seen. A tornado stretching 2.6 miles across, wider than any ever documented. Scientists in the field, like Howard Bluestein and Joshua Werman, realized in real time that this was not just another violent plains tornado. The data pouring in from mobile radars showed a storm with internal structure more complex than anything in the textbooks. Inside that vast circulation, Rack's pole detected wind speeds exceeding 295 miles per hour near the surface, and up to 313 miles per hour within the tightest subvortices. These readings place El Reno among the fastest winds ever measured on Earth. The radar beams slicing through the rain and debris revealed multiple smaller whirls, each a tornado in its own right, spinning around the main core. Some of these subvortices raced along the tornado's edge at over 170 miles per hour, carving narrow, violent tracks that sometimes lasted only seconds. One Rack's pole operator later recalled that it grew from a tight vortex to a monstrous multi-vortex ring in just a few minutes. Despite the radar evidence of extraordinary winds, the official rating for the El Reno tornado would remain Enhanced Fujita 3. The Enhanced Fujita scale, used by the National Weather Service, is based not on wind speed, but on damage left behind. Survey teams walked the 16.2-mile path, searching for destroyed homes, leveled buildings, or scoured foundations, the kinds of clues that would justify an Enhanced Fujita 4 or Enhanced Fujita 5 rating. But the tornado's most violent winds swept over open fields, missing the robust structures that serve as benchmarks for the highest ratings. Where the tornado did hit homes, the damage matched Enhanced Fujita 3 criteria. Roofs torn off, walls collapsed, but not the total obliteration seen in the most extreme cases. This gap between what radar measured and what the ground revealed sparked debate among meteorologists and storm researchers. Some argued that mobile radar, with its ability to peer inside the storm, should play a bigger role in rating tornadoes. Others insisted that the enhanced Fujita scale's focus on consistency and on communicating risk to the public must remain central. For El Reno, the rating stayed Enhanced Fujita 3, even as the scientific record showed wind speeds that rivaled the deadliest tornadoes in history. The paradox stands as a reminder. The true power of a tornado can far exceed what is visible in its aftermath, and sometimes the most violent winds leave little trace at all. At 6.28 p.m., the El Reno tornado veered sharply, its path jolting northeast with a speed and unpredictability that defied even the most seasoned storm chasers. Mobile radar teams and spotters tracking the storm watched as the circulation ballooned outward, sweeping across rural roads and fields in a matter of minutes. The tornado's main core, already the widest ever recorded, was now accompanied by a rare anticyclonic satellite tornado spinning in the opposite direction and circling the main vortex for nearly 15 minutes. This satellite, confirmed by radar and ground observations, added another layer of danger, creating a chaotic wind field that was nearly impossible to predict from the ground. Chasers who had positioned themselves south and east of the initial track found themselves suddenly in the direct path of violent winds. GPS logs and dashcam records reveal a desperate scramble as vehicles reversed course, cutting across muddy fields and narrow farm roads in search of escape. The storm's lateral expansion, combined with the hidden satellite vortex, meant that safe zones vanished without warning. Even veteran teams like Twistex, led by Tim Samaras, his son Paul and Carl Young, were caught off guard. Their final GPS transmissions show them attempting to reposition eastward, unaware that the tornado's outer circulation was racing toward them at highway speed. Their vehicle was struck by a sub-vortex at the edge of the tornado, and all three lost their lives within seconds. Richard Henderson, another chaser, was killed farther north, also overtaken by the tornado's unpredictable surge. For motorists and residents, the experience was harrowing. Many who tried to flee by car found themselves trapped as the tornado's path shifted without warning. Visibility was near zero, 
and the roar of the wind drowned out sirens and radio alerts. In total, eight people died as a direct result of the tornado, and 151 more were injured, most of them in vehicles caught on rural roads or highways. The El Reno tornado's erratic track and explosive growth overwhelmed even those who had spent years studying and chasing storms. For the first time, storm chasers, experts who made a living out of understanding tornado behavior, became victims themselves. The tragedy underscored a hard truth. No amount of experience or technology could guarantee safety when nature changed the rules in real time. Just after 6.30 p.m., a tornado emergency was issued for the Oklahoma City metro area. Broadcasters urged residents to take shelter immediately, but the warnings also unleashed a wave of panic. On highways and feeder roads leading into the city, thousands of vehicles jammed into gridlock. Interstate 40, already busy with evening traffic, became a parking lot as families, commuters, and storm chasers all tried to escape the storm's projected path. Some drivers, hearing live reports that the tornado was headed straight for the city, abandoned their cars and ran to overpasses or low spots, hoping for protection. Others, caught in the confusion of conflicting advice, shelter in place or flee, found themselves stuck with nowhere to go. Congestion on the roads was immediate and severe. Within 15 minutes of the tornado emergency, traffic stretched for miles. Emergency vehicles struggled to navigate the chaos, and police scanners crackled with reports of stalled cars and stranded motorists. For many, the decision to flee by car, made in haste, left them more vulnerable than if they had stayed put. The rain-wrapped tornado, invisible behind curtains of precipitation, loomed just beyond sight and the threat was compounded by a new danger. After the tornado lifted, the supercell and its trailing storms unleashed torrential rain over an already saturated landscape. Water poured into creeks and drainage channels, quickly overwhelming the city's flood control systems. Streets and underpasses filled with water in minutes. Drivers who had escaped the tornado now faced rising floodwaters, often with no way to turn around. Rescue teams launched dozens of swift water operations, pulling people from car roofs and trees. In some cases, help arrived too late. That night, 13 people died in flash floods across the Oklahoma City metro. Most in vehicles swept away by water they could not see coming. The same gridlock that had trapped people in the tornado's path now left them stranded in deadly floods. The National Weather Service later described El Reno as the most dangerous tornado in storm-observing history. But it was the cascade of hazards, tornado, traffic, and flood, that revealed just how vulnerable even a modern city could be. The warnings were loud and urgent, yet the combination of fear, confusion, and cascading weather left a trail of loss that extended long after the winds had died down. At 2.6 miles wide, the El Reno tornado set a world record on May 31, 2013, the widest tornado ever documented. Mobile Doppler radars measured winds up to 313 miles per hour aloft, yet the official enhanced Fujita 3 rating reflected what was found on the ground, not in the clouds. Despite advanced warnings, abrupt changes in track and poor visibility led to eight direct tornado fatalities including four experienced storm chasers and 151 injuries. That same night, historic flash flooding in the Oklahoma City area claimed 14 more lives. While radar and survey data revealed more about tornado structure than ever before, questions remain about how to best warn and protect the public when storms behave unpredictably. The National Weather Service called El Reno the most dangerous tornado in storm-observing history. Today, its legacy continues to shape how we measure, communicate, and respond to severe storms, reminding us that records and technology do not erase risk.